Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gaming Video. We're going to be explaining why the GPU's parallel computing approach offers so much more performance than a traditional CPU. So this is quite a complicated subject. I've also done it as an article as well you can check out, which goes a lot more in depth into this. But I wanted to provide a brief overview in this very video. So I'm sure many of you would have seen the emphasis in the news regarding the PS4s and the Xbox One's GPU as well as memory bandwidth and less is discussed regarding the CPU. It's not maligned, it's not ignored, but at the same time there's less of a big deal made of it. And you've got to remember that the AMD Jaguar, which is the CPU in both machines, puts out just over 100 G-flops of computing power. Now this is contrary to the rather impressive amount of performance that, for example, the PS4's GPU puts out, which is almost two T-flops. And you may be forgiven to say, well, that's just because they've chosen like a low-powered CPU for the PS4 and the Xbox One, and obviously PCs are significantly better. That's true, they are significantly more powerful, but even so, most CPUs, even on the high-spec PCs, are only hitting around the 200 G-flop range. Perhaps even 300, obviously this is not um, double precision, we're discussing single precision here. And obviously as well, we're not discussing like very high-end, super powerful servers, that type of thing. Um, and this is contrary to, say, the GPUs, which are hitting between 5, 6, even 10 G-flops of computing power. And so this gulf between them has been around for a while, and it's not really down to a single factor. Up until the mid-2000s, the traditional and primary way that people would look at CPU performance was just to look at the clock speed. This is one of the reasons that AMD bought in their so-called PR numbers, particularly back in the days of like the Barton and uh, XPs, because quite simply, Despite the fact that their CPU speed was slower than the P than the Pentium 4 equivalent, they would perform just as well. And also, of course, we've had die shrinking. This would be, for example, if you've heard the term 45NM, 32NM, uh, 22NM, and so on and so forth. Basically, every few years, the process of the die, the actual size of all the transistors, shrinks. It gets smaller. As it gets smaller, more of them can be packed on the same type of surface area. Therefore, we can get more processing power in roughly the same amount of space. In the good news is, as well, this keeps the power requirements low. Unfortunately, you can only keep doing that for a certain amount of time, because what basically starts happening is that, well, heat goes up through the roof. Intel's netburst architecture originally was supposed to go undergo similar treatment. It was supposed to have a couple of die shrinks and improvements overall on the architecture, and Intel was actually planning to reach about 10 gigahertz. Unfortunately, by the end of the Pentium 4's lifespan, it just about managed to hit 4 gigahertz. Now, obviously, there were enthusiasts which managed to get it a lot higher, particularly if they were using, let's say, elaborate cooling methods, but Generally speaking, for a single standard air cooler, about 4 GHz was the limit that Intel were comfortable pushing. And because there are only a certain amount of things you can do to improve the IPC, um, for example, if we were to look at, say, Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge and um, Haswell, there's only about a 20% difference in performance from Sandy to Haswell. And even a per, on a per clock basis, if you were to look at say the Intel i5-750, which was released way back in mid-2009, it's only about 40% slower per clock than the i5-4670. And this is despite the fact that you've got a lot more, uh, you've got advanced vector instructions and other things as well installed onto the CPU. So in other words, the option of just constantly improving, increasing the clock speed just isn't sustainable on a long period of time. So therefore, the developer, or should I say the manufacturers, were forced to go wide. They were forced to put in multiple uh, slower clocked cores, uh, more efficient cores, rather than just simply cranking up the clock speed. So now, of course, what we have are situations where you've got two, four, six, or even eight cores, and developers are basically forced to code for all of these CPUs. So in other words, what they don't want, uh, let's say you have core zero, which is generally referred to as the first core, 
You don't want a situation where core 0 has a workload of like 100% and say core 1, 2 and 3, so in other words the other remaining 3 cores, you don't want them to be at like 20 or 30% because basically your CPU bound on the core 0 and the other cores are not being utilized effectively, therefore you're getting bottlenecks because your code isn't efficient. This is all down to how GPUs and CPUs are developed. CPUs are developed and optimized for sequential serial processing, in other words, one instruction at a time, and GPUs are designed with simultaneous instructions in mind, juggling thousands of threads, in some cases at once. One of the primary reasons that you can't have a CPU with tons and tons and tons of cores is CPUs require a lot of control hardware. CPUs aren't just calculators, which pretty much is what a GPU is. It needs to do a hell of a lot more, so while GPUs can allocate a lot of space for multiple cores, CPUs need more complicated core structures because they are basically responsible for running a lot of the, well, they are pretty much responsible for running all of the um, tasks on the system. So, for example, they are responsible for allocating memory, setting up jobs for the GPU, controlling other devices, for example audio, and even running the standard typical game logic. You can almost think of the CPU as like the smart one. It isn't as fast, it's not as strong, but it's much better at decision making, allocating resources, and you could consider it to be general purpose, a jack of all trades. Meanwhile, the GPU doesn't have to pay this sacrifice. The GPU can afford to be a bit dumber. It could pretty much just allocate all of this space to basically shaders. Also, you've got to consider the difference in cache, a rather massive amount of the space on a modern G uh, CPU is taken up by either the level 2 or level 3 cache. And how much obviously depends on the CPU, but certainly like a quarter or so is pretty standard. That's a lot of space and a considerably larger die area than what the GPU is uh, allocating. Therefore, because the control, stru the control structure, I'm sorry, of these uh, GPU cores is extremely simple and because it doesn't need to worry about so many different complex control structures as well as the cache size, you could basically pack a lot more uh, computing power on there. So for example, a GPU might have one, one and a half megabytes of memory uh, for say the level two cache and it will also have a small amount of cache as well for either the compute units or SMX for AMD or uh, NVIDIA GPUs respectively. On the other hand, a CPU from say AMD or Intel might have say 4, 6 or even 8 megabytes of uh, cache on the actual system for level 3 as, uh, by itself. So what we've now got is the CPU which will handle most of the code and certain, ext uh, certain intensive I'm sorry, operations will be pushed to the GPU, however the CPU still handles much of this. So it will basically tell the GPU how it should process the command, when it should process the command, and it will basically move the data from the CPU's memory to the GPU, launch, or in some cases people call it kick, the uh, process off on the GPU, and then the results are basically copied back to the CPU. It's a little bit different in situations where it's a humor, uh, heterogeneous unified memory architecture, because quite simply put, all of the memory, the CPU and the GPU is addressing exactly the same piece of memory. However, there are still times when it does need to make some copies over, particularly in cases of if it's stored in cache. And you've also got to take into account other latencies, for example, the syncing of data. That's, in other words, making sure that the GPU and CPU both know and understand that they're working on the present piece of data. And a GPU really doesn't give a crap if it's running, say, a thousand threads. In fact, even a low-end GPU is pretty much just waking up if it's hitting a thousand threads. In fact, you can tell it to launch 10,000 threads, 20,000 threads, 100,000 threads, up to you, as long as you've got the performance to run it. Of course, these threads are, in the case of games, running simultaneous to graphics. So what generally happens in the case of 
either AMD or NVIDIA's hardware is that they'll have basically schedulers to tell it when and where to process this data. So in other words, should it run on, say, these sets of cores? Should it run um, at a certain part of a frame? That type of thing. So here's a very basic example. This is not a particularly useful scenario in programming. Don't worry, there's no programming or high-level mathematics. I've deliberately made this as simple as possible. Let's say that you want to do a ridiculously silly task like outputting various numbers on screen just for the sheer sake of it. Well, let's assume that we have a couple of numbers to begin with. Let's say we have 1 million. We'll call that and put that in A. But for B, let's say 2. So let's say you want to take A and divide by B. And so in which case, you then copy the results to C. Now you've got the results in C. You keep the value of C. In other words, it remains C. And you've also got A and B remaining as well. So those values have not changed. So A, B, C is now exactly all the same. And then what you've got is C is now divided by B again. And then you've got the result from this operation and copied into, let's say, E. And it continues to do this, this, this silly application that we've just created. It continues to do this until it gets to the number closest to 100, um, which would be kind of like an example of a, of a loop, uh, kind of a conditional statement very silly example but still now in this case it would be the CPU's job to allocate the memory as well as to copy the operation to the GPU's memory so in other words it would say okay this amount of memory is allocated to this task and then it copies that piece of date that piece of code over it tells the GPU hey here's the data that you know you need I need you to do the following and it will tell it you know what it basically has to do in terms of the compute code and then it will just leave the GPU to process the data and then the results will be copied back over or alternatively made available for the CPU again to process depending on if it's humor or not and that's pretty much it guys so most of the performance as I've stated does tank when dealing with syncing of data therefore it's important that the correct tasks are selected for GPU compute because basically what you don't want is a situation where by the time it's been allocated, the resources have been allocated, it's started off, it's been computed, it's either been copied back or made available or synced or whatever needs to be done with that particular command. It could have just been simpler and faster just to have let it happen on the CPU. However, obviously there are certain tasks which are lending themselves to parallel computing much more heavily, for example, physics and AI and so on, and also slightly more latency tolerant. And you've got to remember the GPUs are throughput based. They are not based on latency. So this is a bit of an odd distinction. Um, but throughput is basically like saying, okay, we're going to get as many tasks done in a small period of time. They don't care about necessarily the weight of one particular task, of one particular individual. What they care is the numbers, how many people, you could consider it almost like a queue system, like if you were going to like a shop. They don't necessarily care if the one customer takes say two minutes they care how many customers on average are being pushed through per hour because they want especially in a busy times for example lunch hour in a cafe there is as many people gone as possible on the other hand cpus are not based like this they are designed to minimize the latency of a per task and look at things very much in a isolated manner in that respect Anyway guys, hopefully you've enjoyed the video, I'll see you soon, take care, bye for now.